In John's prayer, he indicated, not my will, but thine be done. And listening to the various prayers offered by the brethren, I many times hear that and certainly pray it myself. When you look in Luke 22 and verse 42, there in the Garden of Gethsemane with the load upon his shoulders and heart that none of us can ever begin to imagine. Our Lord said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Those are some of those wonderful words in all the Bible. We are free moral agents. We have the power of choice. Jesus was as much a human as you are or I am. He was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He willed to do the Father's will that only he could do because through him is salvation and no one else. He knew that. But as a man having to undergo terrible suffering and what was going to be between him and his death on the cross in a matter of hours, he still petitioned the Father if it be possible, and of course it was not, let this cup pass from me. But then he exercised that free moral agency and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I suggest to you that he had this bearing upon his mind and brought back to his mind regularly over the next several hours of terrible suffering. Judas, of course, earlier had already departed to betray Jesus, the hands of his enemies. And the cross with all of its shame and horrors lie ahead only a few hours away. Only he could know the agony and the shame that was to be his. We can never fathom it. It dwarfs our pitiful mental states, finite minds, to try to understand our Lord at this time, the great terrible agony involved in his sacrifice to save us from our sins how many times in his mind possibly on his lips throughout the next hours of great torment and suffering would he say nevertheless not my will but thine be done if we would serve Jesus we will ever in the review of our lives the light of truth and the place Christ has in saving us from our sins, ever be saying, not my will, but thine be done. They arrested him. They hired false witnesses for the trial. They delivered him up to the governor Pilate. They mocked him. They scourged him. They placed a crown of thorns upon his head. And how often I think of the terrible act of scourging that he said, not my will, but thine be done. And then finally, he's able to get to the place of crucifixion through the help of another because he fell so weak. He fell beneath the Lord of the cross. And when they get him there, they nail him to that cross. It had to be at that time that again, if it ever left his mind, that our Lord said, not my will, but thine be done. I hope that these words will serve to those who may not be Christians and are in this audience this morning to seriously think about your life. But I hope it will motivate everyone here who's a child of God, who wears the name of Christ, Christian, that means of Christ that we will understand that suffering is a part of being faithful to God and going to heaven. The way to heaven is straight and narrow, hemmed in on all sides by the commandments of God 
And one cannot just lackadaisically, nonchalantly enter into it and walk it. There is a great stricture of mind in bringing our bodies in subjection to Jesus Christ. Paul understood that when he said that if after having preached to others, he himself was cast away, and prefaced that by saying that he brought his body into subjection. He buffeted it, whatever was necessary to keep this tabernacle in harmony and in subjection to God. I'm willing to do it. And so what a great example there is in Jesus when he said, not my will, but thine be done. It's important to understand that sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, verse 4, results from not thy will, but mine be done. All the woes of the world have resulted from reversing the order of that prayer of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our wills probably are the greatest thing in our lives that stands between us and becoming Christians or in Christ, growing and developing in spiritual things. We must will to do right as the Bible defines the right. And our whole life is set upon that course of conduct. God told Adam and Eve that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.17 But the devil, through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, tempted Eve. She believed the lie. She obeyed a lie. And she sinned. And she offered it to Adam. And he just took it and ate it. Because they weren't paying attention to the will of God being done. Sometimes I hear people saying, well, you just broke one, one commandment. Look at all the other good things you're doing. Well, that's a meritorious idea of living the Christian life, and that won't work. That your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, and because your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then heaven will be your home. Not taught in the Scriptures. It has nothing to do with Christianity. What happened there? was they had only one commandment to keep. They had one commandment. And they didn't do it. And I know the fundamental reason. Whether they thought it through or not. And it was this. Not thy will, but mine be done. It was not that they were ignorant of what God commanded them to do. They want to do something else. And of course they did. We're talking about dispositions of heart. We're talking about a state of mind, an attitude. It's not by accident that the Lord begins what we know as the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes, the beautiful mindsets, the beautiful attitudes. And thus, He's giving us a mind check that we must have the attitude of regardless of what I must sacrifice in this life of the pain and toil that must come upon me I will do I will do God's will I think though the attitude that was found in Eve and Adam is too much typical of why we sin God has revealed his will to us but it just comes down to this. We all too often want to have our own way. I suggest when you look at all of the various congregation of God's people, even from the New Testament to this present hour, I have no doubt till the end of time, however long that may be, that a great many of the problems, if not most of them, in the church will be because of people saying, not thy will, but mine be done. God delivered Israel from bondage down in Egypt. And he provided for them what they couldn't in his providential care, of course, as they journeyed in the wilderness. He gave them what we know as the law of Moses to follow. And in Deuteronomy 6, 12, Moses, not long before his death, before the children of Israel under Joshua would go into the land of Canaan. 
Moses in Deuteronomy, which means a restatement of the law, said to them, Beware, lest thou forget the Lord. Why would he need to say that to people who had undergone all they had for 40 years? Because that's just the way we are. Think of the people alive today, say in their 20s, maybe 30s, maybe even 40s, who are not that impressed with the great sacrifice this nation made in World War II to keep the world free. Not impressed at all. So if people are like that in the affairs of this present world, then what about when it comes to serving God here on earth? In fact, you'll read this in Psalm 106, verses 13 and 14 of the children of Israel. They soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Isn't that a sad thing? All that you read in Deuteronomy says, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. In fact, he'll go ahead and say, you'll say you won't forget, and you will say that you will keep doing God's will, but you won't. He even tells them that before they do it. And what happens? They didn't. Now, what caused their departure from God? Summing it all up, it's simply this. Not thy will, but mine be done. Look at every problem the children of Israel had. And that's what it was. When Joshua and Caleb went into the land of promise, the only two out of 20 years old and upward that left Egypt, it was because they lived their life saying, not our will, but God's will be done. That is, in fact, faithfulness. When you come on into the Old Testament and those things written aforetime for our learning, Romans 15, 4, you see a state of mind again of the same kind Adam and Eve had. And that is in the mind of priest of God, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. The scripture says that they offered strange fire which the Lord had not commanded. You know, anything we do claiming it to be God's work but God never authorized it, that's strange to God. That's why it was strange fire. Fire came from a place the law of Moses said it's not supposed to come to use it for this purpose. Their disobedience resulted, of course, in their deaths, and that seems not to really impress a lot of people, though it was written for our learning. And it all happened because they wanted it their way and not God's way. One of the classic examples of not thy will but mine be done is found in the life of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You remember he was commanded, authorized by God to go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. I don't think how well, much of that would be very unpleasant to do. And you would have to have the attitude of not my will but thine be done. But I don't think that it was a matter of misunderstanding that caused the problem. It was a matter of saying we will do as we please. And it was led by the king. The scripture says Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, of the oxen. When I think about that for a minute, they had to exercise their own thinking about what was good, better, best, and how they would do it. That's not God's will, but ours be done. And God must accept it because we're going to make these sacrifices to God and we have a good thought in the matter. God's reply, though, was, I think, as simple as it can be, and most of you know it. Through the great prophet Samuel, he was told to obey is better than sacrifice, verse 22. Now Saul understood what he should do. 
Again, it comes down to this. But I want to do things my way. His was the attitude, not thy will, but mine be done. And that's still what guides most people, and I fear greatly many in the church, on some things. I think if you look at this prayer of Christ and the part we're looking at, you'll see that that was the theme of our Lord's life on earth. Jesus lived as he prayed. When he was about 12 years old, he said, notice the obligation he felt. I must be about my father's business, Luke 2, 49. 12 years old. I must be about my father's business. Remember now thy creator in the days of you, thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. The earlier you can become a devoted servant of God by obeying the gospel, the better you will dodge out on bad habits that can be formed when you're not really interested through youth in doing God's will. Jesus left us an example. Well, he did so then at this age of doing God's will. In discussing with the disciples their appetite, here's what he said. My food, my meat, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 4, 34. Is that our attitude? Again in John 6, 38, Jesus said of himself and the work he had to do to save you and me from our sins, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. His purpose on earth was not my will, but thine be done. Thus when he comes near the close of his life, he prays to his Father, I have glorified thee in the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John 17, 4. Paul echoed, echoed that as he reviewed his life not long before he would die. He said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid it for me a crown of righteousness, not for me only, but all those that love his appearing. There's no reason that any faithful child of God cannot take that same view. In fact, you will. Because daily as you live in the church, you crucify the world to yourself. You separate yourself from it. That which governs most people is sensual and material. Those things pale into insignificance the older you get in laboring to bring your will in subjection to God and how you should view life and the purpose of it and eternity. To fully appreciate the Lord's Prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, we must understand that he left the glory of heaven, which we cannot begin to understand what that means when we speak of the glory of heaven, and the very presence of his Father to become a human being and come to this earth. And he will forever remain a human being. But he's a glorified human being, having blazed the trail for us and left us the directions in the New Testament, how that we can be faithful unto death and also on that day of resurrection be glorified even as he's glorified. Thus John says, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him when we see him as he is. Now, knowing all that about Christ, ask yourself the question, how was he treated? How do people deal with Jesus Christ? The great prophet Isaiah, the Messianic prophecy, writing over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. In that great chapter of Isaiah 53, said in verse 3, He was despised and rejected of men. Why? Well, it's because people want to do what they want to do, and they don't intend to have folks tell them otherwise. And even though his mission was to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10, 
He was envied. He was hated. He was opposed vehemently by those who should have been ready to accept him after 1,500 years of living under the law. And Paul tells us it was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. But they didn't. They sought his life. Praying in the garden, he knew his death was near. Notice what he says. I lay down my life. Then he said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. John 10, 17 and 18. He knew what he could do to escape all that ordeal. Now you're in his position and you say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And you know better than anybody that ever was what's ahead of you in the next few hours. And you have the power to walk away from it. And to punish the whole sin-sick, rebellious world. But he didn't. And aren't you glad he didn't? He was willing to die that shameful, agonizing death on the cross. And it was because of the state of mind he had, the attitude, the disposition of heart, not my will but thine. That tells me somewhat, so I can understand it, of the worth of my soul. If the great second person of the Godhead would become flesh and dwell among us, be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, then willingly go to the cross when it be easier not to. To save us from our sins. Notice what Paul said to the Corinthians about him in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now Jesus therefore could say, Not my will, but thy be done. Because that was his life. He lived it, and he prayed as he lived. That prayer should therefore be a pattern for our lives, our disposition of heart, attitude toward God's word, and living it. Hereunto were ye called, Paul, Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. It's the gospel that calls us, you know. Hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Thus to show the requirements of discipleship, we read Jesus saying, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16:24. Notice the denial of self. Have you ever been doing what you knew the Lord said you were supposed to do and all faithful people would do it and according to your several ability you're doing it but you had rather be doing something else as far as the flesh in the interest of this present world is concerned. But you don't. You do the Father's will and you let your will go by the wayside. And if we heed his teaching, if we heed his call to follow me, then we will do as Jesus did. Too many, even devoted religious people, have the attitude then that destroys the unity of God's people, promotes sectarian denominationalism and false religions everywhere, and that is simply not thy will but mine be done. Our Lord showed us something in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. We're familiar with it. He said plainly in no uncertain terms, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me, not a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess 
unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, they're calling him Lord. They know he's Lord. They did things that they thought were service to the Lord. Lord said, I never knew you. What was wrong with them? They are doing things to suit themselves and calling it faithful service to God. Like Saul, a person may seek to sacrifice for God. But such service, if we call it that, would be rejected because the disposition of their hearts is, not thy will, but mine be done. And those in Matthew 7, verse 22, are rejected. And they are rejected believers in Christ. They are rejected religious people. Well, why? Because they, like Saul, were trying to serve God according to their own ideas, their own views, and thought God would accept it. That's as old as Cain. It's exactly what he did. Instruction was given to Cain and Abel. God's will was made known to them. Abel kept it, Hebrews 11, 4. Cain didn't, but he worshipped. He offered a sacrifice. He did not abide by that which God had taught him to do, and he was rejected. They did what they wanted. The truth reminds that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. We must ever remember that we purify our souls by our obedience to the truth, 1 Peter 1.22, and nothing else. So we need to ever have the, the, the mindset of that prayer of our Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Now we'll spend in closing a few minutes on the application further of this to ourselves. You see it all around you. Not the Lord's church is presented on the pages of the New Testament. But our church is. That's what you see. That's why there is denominationalism, which is foreign to the Bible. They don't even have the attitude Christ had toward the church in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. And he did in Acts chapter 2. And to that church he adds all those who believe the gospel and obey it and are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.47. It is the one body of Christ, the church. Colossians chapter 1.18. It is our Lord's bride, Ephesians 5.22-32. And for those who are honest before God and with themselves and God's word, who seek the truth of the Bible regarding salvation, they will accept it as it is and say, not our will, but thine be done. But there are those who still, and I guess will always do so, regarding the church, say, not thy church, but mine. You go to your church, I go to mine. We'll all get to heaven together. Even though the Lord bought his church with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. And when you say the church has nothing to do with salvation, since the Lord purchased the church with his blood, and the purchase price is surely worth the thing bought, then you're saying the blood of Christ is not worth anything. The Lord thought the church was worth something. What was it? The purchase price. What was that price? The shed blood of Christ. Acts 20, 28. Thus he adds the saved to that church. So when are people going to learn to say, not my will about the church, but the Lord's will about the church? People ask, well, how can I be saved my sins? And when you go to the different religious leaders, you get all kinds, a variety of answers. Because people are depending upon themselves. You remember when Jesus came to the border of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, uh, Who do men say that I'm the Son of Man? And I always say when I'm teaching on that, that's when the some says come out. 
that class of the some say. Some say, and they give who they said. Then he says, but whom do you say that I am? Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter understood Christ because of that which proved Christ to be the Son of God. John 20, 30, and 31 tells us much about that. So how can I be saved? Well, I'm, I'm going to do what the Pope says. I don't have the complete collection of Billy Graham and all he said. Billy Graham never could even figure out about baptism, and he opposed it as far as saying one must be baptized to be saved. And when you read his biography, he was baptized about five times. I often wonder, what, if, if baptism has nothing to do with salvation, why were you baptized? And there are those, the Baptists, who teach that, well, you can't get the Baptist church without being baptized, but you can be saved by Christ without it being baptized. So it's harder to get in the Baptist church than it is to be saved by Christ. Well, then don't get in it. Just be saved by Christ by saying, not my will, but thine be done. And that's true of any human institution. The Bible still says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It still says, repent to the believers. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Mark 16, 16, and Acts 2, 38. Paul plainly wrote and made it clear that we're cleansed by the blood of Christ, Romans 3, 23 through 26, and that there's not anything else that can wash away our sins, Hebrews 9, 22, and chapter 10, and verse 4. But he then writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, in verses 8 through 10 of that same chapter, and in chapter 6, verse 3, that we're justified by faith, well, that means to be justified by faith, we have to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. Well, he shed his blood when he died. I've got to reach that blood. How can I do it? When I'm baptized into his death, where he shed his blood, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. That believing, repentant Saul of Tarsus was told, and now why tearest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You can't call on the name of the Lord and saying, Lord, save me, and not be willing to submit to what he said in being baptized into Christ. If you think you can, then you're saying not thy will, but mine be done. And that won't work. You can bring this on over to worship and what the items of worship are. The fact that a multiplicity of peace will use a, people will use a mechanical instrument of music or all sorts of claptrap and claim that's all right. They could read the New Testament and see that every time that music is talked about when it comes to worshiping God, every time it says sing. That's what's authorized. I have no business adding to it what I want. That's my will, not thine be done. But to stick strictly with his will expressed in the words of the book. And therefore I'll sing. Yeah, but. Well, don't yell, but. That's your will standing up. Just do what he said. In the way he said do it. And for the reason that he said do it. How shall we live our lives? Well, for what is a man profited? If he gain the whole world, lose his own soul. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20 Now how was such dedication possible? Could he... Is he the only one that can do it? No, every one of us not only can, but we must do what he did. But when we become so wrapped up in the affairs of this present world that the Lord's kingdom takes second spot in our lives, then we're saying there's something more important than the church of our Lord. Well, we close by simply saying, as Jesus lived, so he prayed. I've emphasized that already. Not my will, but thine be done. One example, that is, for us. And that should be the motto of our life. Not my will, but thine be done. If you're a child of God, we're thankful you are. And we urge you to be faithful. Don't give up. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abandoning the work of the Lord. But if you're not, you know what to do this morning. If you've listened, 
you serious about it to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you sin, you must repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, keep this in mind as you go through this song. Not my will, but thine be done. So come to the Lord if you need while we stand and sing.